Thank you, Robert. I, I don't find myself as someone who's shy, but every time you heap all of those nice words on me, I find myself blushing. And that's not a typical West African thing, we don't blush. <laughs> it's truly an honor for me to be here and coming to this event yeah, was not something that I had to overthink. The only thing I had to do was overthink how I manage my eight children because this is the moment when everyone has to be preparing to go back um, to Africa. Over 13 years ago, a group of friends of, and myself decided that we were going to change history in our country with 10 US dollars out of the handbag of one of the sisters, we sat down and wrote a statement. And in that statement, we had indicated that we wanted three things to happen. Immediate unconditional ceasefire, a fruitful dialogue between the warring parties, and the deployment of an intervention force. Those three things were the three things the detector of the day, Charles Taylor, was refusing to do. One, he would fight till the last soldier died. Two, as a legitimate government, he could never negotiate with rebels. Three, Liberia was a sovereign state and he was not going to allow foreign troops on his ground. When we wrote the statement, we sat in the room, seven of us, thinking, so who do we say wrote this statement? <laughs> and one of the sisters said, the women of Liberia, and my answer to them was, is it not fraudulent for seven people to sit in a room and call themselves the women of Liberia? And so we decided we would name ourselves. But this is a time when the government had issued an order that if anyone protested, the president has said, even his mother, they should be arrested and flogged. So we sat down and wrote our names. And then someone said, so what do we do with this statement? We said, let's publish it but we do not have the money. And one woman reached in her bag and said, this is all that I have, 10 US dollars. We called a female journalist, Janet, that we knew, and said, Janet, can you publish this? She said, I can do that. The next morning, every news outlet wanted to meet the seven brave women who dared to put their names on that paper. That was the beginning of the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace. From seven women, with only $10, we transform into over 20,000 women in 14 communities across Liberia. One UN worker described us as the cancer that had eaten Liberia during the war because everywhere you turn, there were cells of women in white protesting the war. By the time we were ending that, that work, we begin to think that peace Cannot, we cannot say that we found peace by the signing of the accord. We needed to do something to ensure that we had sustainable peace. Those women again decided, let's continue, but we need to be a part of the democracy. Where are we going to get money to do civic and voters' education? Through a stroke of luck, someone said the American Jewish World Service. So we decided, let's sit down. I didn't own a laptop at the time, I must say. And being in, in, in San Francisco is really weird that 13, 13 years ago, I didn't own a laptop. So I sat down and wrote the proposal with my hand, and then I sent it to someone who typed it up, and we sent it by email. We sent it, and after a week, we heard back that a grant of $10,000 had been given to us. We were over the moon because this is the first time some sustained entity had taken a risk with us. We went on to do civic and voters education. And by the time we ended, because all of the work that we had done in communities and our analysis of the political situation was showing that women were not going to come out to vote, even though we had been heavily involved in the peace process. One, because in, our, in the history of Liberia, Women were never allowed to vote except women property owners, and that was in 1957. So ordinary women that I worked with did not even have the clue that they had any stake in the political process. We went to the UN and asked them to give us money. No one would believe us. 
Five days into voter's registration, they came back to us to say, we are not getting any women registered. Fortunately, we had the seed grain from AJWS. We got into seven communities and deployed 250 women. And over five days, we were able to register over 10,000 women who would not have registered anyway. By the time we finished our effort and other women's organization finished, we had 50 plus one women register than men. And that we have Africa's first female president is not rocket science. Moving into that work, we decided we wanted to do something around justice for women. And I'll tell you all this crazy story. Because then we wrote back to AJWS and said we needed to do a radio program where women could talk about their issues. So we sent a proposal, of course. They were comfortable with us because we had done a great job the first time. And I think they, they scaled it up a bit to $12,000. <laughs> so we got that money and decided we're going into rural communities to meet with about 50 women so that they tell us what we needed to discuss on the radio program. And we're going to train them so that they will be on the radio talking about their issues. So we did a conference style workshop. And by the time we had spent three hours in the room, one of the women said, I want to go outside. This room is too hot. I never went to school. I don't want to sit on chair. And everyone started revolting. So I was like, okay, I'm in a big trouble here. We went outside, sat in front of the church that we were using as the space to work. And one after the other, each of these women were telling us different stories. One told us the story of how she pushed the soldiers in her community for justice until she got it. Another told the story how her daughter was raped on her way to school. Another told the story of the domestic violence. One after the other, each 50 women told their story. And for three days, we just sat down and people told us the story. Finally, at the end of the day, I turned to my assistant and said, we've listened to the story and we've not done the work. What are we going to tell the donors? And then we said to the women, but this is not what we came to do. You all just told us stories. So what are those things that we're going to do on the radio program? And one of the older women who had never sat in class looked at me for a long time and said, don't tell me you are that dumb. Every story we told you over the last three days are the things that we want to talk about on the radio. So we went back, sat down, and started breaking the stories down. There were justice issue, rape issue, reproductive health issue, early marriage issue, and those were the issues that we decided to do. Fast forward, I moved to Ghana after getting my graduate degree and started an organization. Decided that we've done great work with women and needed to work with girls. Again, AJWS came through. This time, they scaled it up to $20,000. I went into different communities working with young girls, telling them the importance of education. I've met several young girls. I met several young girls on that journey, but I want to tell you about two of them. One, Georgia Ginoe. Georgia was a very active young woman when we met her. She was in college and she said to me, Madam, you know it's very, very hard to go to school. Sometimes these older men will say, you're telling us that we need to go to, to get education. We have to stick it out. How do you? when people are telling you you have to sleep with them to do it. And if you really want education, sometimes you have to succumb. And I turned to her and said, there is always another way. So we work with that one. I met another one, Juanita, who before she was 20 already had five children because she had been raped repeatedly during the war. And she was never really sure of herself that she could finish high school, but she was just pushing herself until we met her. And then I told her, you know you can be a leader. She said, I feel like I can be a leader we decided to set up a reading room, again with support from AJWS in her community. And the day we walked into that community, I went with my jeans, my t-shirt, and ready to work. I got into the community 10 in the morning. The hut that we had formed to set up the reading room was already painted. The entire community had been mobilized by Juanita. When we started the foundation, we gave Juanita a scholarship. She went to, to college, finished high school, went to college, Today she has a bachelor's in agriculture, work with an agriculture organization, and her dream is to start her own farm. Georgia graduated a year ago from the Clinton School of Government, and she's currently working here in the US, hopefully to go back home and continue what she started doing, mobilizing young people. Finally, last year again, we went back to AJWS and said, we have students, we're paying their school fees, but we recognize that these girls are not taking on leadership role. 
and they gave us money, $30,000, to do the work. We took these girls into our room for three weeks where they did training, met, met with different women, and afterwards, 30, all 20 of them in two different groups decided to do their projects for change in their community. Today, I'm proud to report that these girls are in their community working with other girls and telling them about the importance of education. But beyond that, this group of young women, this year's elections, decided, even though most of them are first-time female voters, they were going to work with women activists to mentor them and go into grassroots community to help other young people do the work that they do. To say that I'm a hero, I will be lying to you, I'm not. What I do is that I feel something in my heart and I step out to do it. But feeling something in your heart and stepping out to do it is one thing. Finding an organization that trusts you, that believes in you and decide that I will invest, even though I don't know where the hell this is going, but I'm just trusting that this is a game-changing idea. And this is what AJWS has been to me. When I say I did not have to think too much about coming to this program, it's because I tell people I'm loyal to three key organizations, AJWS, the African Women's Development Fund, and anything that Abby Disney does. The reason why I say this is because even in my craziest moment, these are people who would, I can turn to during the Ebola crisis. I pick up the phone and call Ruth and say, you've heard. She said, I was waiting for this call. They again contributed to our grassroots initiative. All of these things that I've just told you and the stories are not just stories. These are transformative stories, stories where young people, women in their communities have taken charge of peace effort, justice effort, and educational effort, young women have been mentored and socialized to believe that they can be the change that they read about. And all of this has been possible because the American Jewish World Service continues to invest in my work. The beauty of the investment is that they never come to me and say, this is our idea of change. It's what idea of change do you have? And that's the idea of change we're going to invest. I tell my kids I have at least 15 more years to keep doing the kind of work that I do. And I know for the next 15 years of my active advocacy work, I can count on AJWS to help me make the change that I've been making in my community. To Robert and his team, I want to say a big thank you by standing by this crazy African woman, even when you didn't know where we were headed. Thank you all very much.